and we're recording. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all very much for joining us today for our regular board meeting. In this meeting, of our, in our regular board meeting, the administration will be presenting information uh, on our strategic plan and how we expect to reach, it, reach our goals. Uh, we're excited that you guys are here to join us tonight. We have a lot of good information um, and a lot of great celebrations. Uh, we have a lot to be thankful for, and um, we're really excited about tonight and information therein. As, gen as uh, we generally are, as I'm calling into order, we like to start with a moment of silence. And as we start this moment of silence, um, I would love for you all to, during this moment of silence, to think about um, uh, the things that are going on as far as, you know, our, what, we're, what we're seeing in America. Um, you know, recently, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple weeks now, um, there was a shooting of a young black man who was just running. He was jogging in a neighborhood. His name was Ahmaud Arbery. Arbery. Um, this is nothing new. This happens every single day. Unfortunately, in recent times, these sorts of race, uh, these sorts of racist uh, events are starting to spike. They're starting to become more common. I really hope and pray that we do not. This does not become our normal. I do not want it. I would want nothing. I do not want this to become what we consider our new norm or something that we get used to. Every single event needs to be pushed to the highest levels of media and attention so that we can um, at least start the process of justice as the two men who are um, arrested uh, are starting to receive. So as we start our moment of silence, please put your thoughts forward to the family of Mr. Arbery and those who are affected every single day by the racist behaviors and the police brutality that we see uh, on a constant cycle in the news. So please join me in a moment of silence. Thank you. As we move to our next item on the agenda, it is celebrations. And uh, I will turn that over to Chip. Good evening, board members, cabinet, and special guests. Uh, we are always happy to be able to celebrate uh, Durham Public Schools, our students, our spectacular staff. And even though we are meeting virtually, today is no exception. And we're going to start off this evening's celebrations with the Durham Public Schools Social Worker of the Year. And to introduce her, I would like to call on Dr. Al Royster. Thank you, Chip. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Mabanga. I am honored to be before you tonight to present the 2019-20 DPS School Social Worker of the Year. Before I begin, I would like to give a quick shout out to all the DPS social workers. You can see all of them in my virtual background, which is a picture taken in a previous monthly professional learning session. They have been a great in providing support to families and connecting them with resources during COVID-19. The 2019-20 DPS Social Worker of the Year, Crystal Bowman, is a social worker at Lucas Middle School. She earned this honor by being nominated and voted upon by her fellow social worker peers. Ms. Bowman supports the students, staff, and community at Lucas Middle School with tireless effort, dedication, and commitment. She was nominated by several of her coworkers, and I would like to briefly share some of their comments. Crystal always demonstrates extraordinary leadership to identify, address, and support the needs of her students. She goes above and beyond at Lucas Middle and creatively implements programs to meet the needs of her students. Crystal works long hours and many times on the weekend to support her students and her families. She oftentimes utilizes her own funds when a student is faced with an immediate crisis. Crystal's efforts and genuine support for her families aren't done for the recognition. Again, I wanna congratulate Ms. Bowman. I am happy to be able to support her as she makes a difference in the lives of her students, staff, and community of Lucas Middle School. And now I'll turn it over to Principal Sanchez. Good evening. I wanna say congratulations to Ms. Bowman. We are so thankful to have you at Lucas. 
Um, um, congratulations for being DPS's School Social Worker of the Year. I'm excited to have the opportunity to celebrate Ms. Bowman's outstanding accomplishment with you this evening. Ms. Bowman has spent the last several years working at Lucas Middle School supporting our students and families. She spends much time and energy making sure that students and families have all of their needs met by making phone calls and home visits. She organized and oversees a food pantry at our school so that bags of food can be sent home every Friday with students. Ms. Bowman serves on our school's MTSS team, and she assists with coaching our STEP team at Lucas. During this time of school closure, Ms. Bowman has continued to work extremely hard in checking in on our families, dropping off food and other essentials, serving each week in residential areas and passing out food. She has helped organize our eighth grade promotion in order that students receive the celebration of their accomplishments that they deserve. I am so thankful to have Ms. Bowman as part of our Lucas Leopards team. Congratulations, Ms. Bowman. And at this time, Ms. Bowman, we would, orig we would ordinarily ask you to walk the red carpet, but as we do not have a red carpet and as Zoom will only let us show your face if you say a few words, would you please say a few words about, and we are so grateful for everything that you do for Durham Public Schools. Yes, thank you, Dr. Royster and Ms. Sanchez. Good evening, DPS board members, Dr. Mabinga, Dr. Hardy, and DPS staff and families. It is an honor to accept and to be recognized for School Social Worker of the Year. I am so grateful for this opportunity to pursue my passion of being a school social worker. I have the opportunity to impact and change the lives of many of my students and families as they have done the same for me. Each day I do my best to empower and advocate for my families and my students in order to help them reach their fullest potential. I absolutely love serving within my school and community and working with my families and students. Through this work, I have learned perseverance and empathy, and I'm truly humbled for this opportunity to carry out my mission for helping others. Even through our current stages of events where we are still connecting and supporting our families through COVID-19. I would like to give a special thanks to Dr. Maddox Perry, the guidance of my supervisor, Dr. Al Royster, the wonderful school social workers of DPS and the best admin team and staff of Lucas Middle School, the students and families of Lucas, and especially my family and friends. You all have been my biggest support and my backbone to helping me become a better me. And thank you to all who have joined this board meeting today. Yay. All right. So I just wanted to show this. <laughs> my son goes to middle, the Lucas. Yay. Congratulations. Wonderful Thank job, Ms. Bowman. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations and thank you so much for everything that you do. There is a round of applause. You can't see it all, but uh, we are so proud of you. We would like to now move to our Student of the Month program. And this month is going to be a twofer. We're going to recognize the May and June Students of the Month from Jordan High School and Hillside High School. Let's start off with the May Student of the Month. And to introduce him, I call on Susan Taylor, principal of Jordan High. Good evening, everyone. I am Susan Taylor, the proud principal of Jordan High School. And I've had the opportunity to serve as Christopher's principal for the past three years. In thinking about what sets Christopher Holiday apart from his peers, the first attribute that comes to mind is self-discipline. During the 2018-19 school year, Christopher was the only member of his class to earn a perfect ACT score. If you listen to Christopher's story, his intentional plan to study, prepare, and practice for the ACT led to his perfect score. Christopher's self-discipline 
has allowed him to successfully navigate high school academically as evident by his transcript, athletically as evident by the school record he holds, and interpersonally as evident by his role as a selected student ambassador. The other attributes that come to mind are Christopher's quiet confidence and leadership that make him a role model for others. If you follow Jordan football, you will notice that Christopher consistently makes plays that change the direction of the game. He thrives under pressure and was instrumental in leading our school to its first outright conference championship since 1973. Christopher holds the second in-season record for the number of interceptions. In the classroom, Christopher is an exemplary student who contributes meaningfully to daily lessons. What I love the most about Christopher is his genuine care for our school community that is supported through his actions. Christopher is a Moorhead Kane scholar and will attend UNC Chapel Hill as he has committed both academically and athletically. Thank you to Durham Public Schools for recognizing Christopher Holiday as our student of the month. And congratulations, Christopher, to you and your family. We love you and we're very proud of you. Congratulations, Christopher. And we would love for you to say a few words. Thank you, Principal Taylor, so much for saying that. I want to say thank you to the Durham Public School Board for giving me this award. It's an honor to receive this award to end my K-312 career, and it's something that I will cherish forever. I also want to say thank you to all the teachers, administrations, and classmates at Jordan for pushing me and supporting me throughout my four years, and I will be a Falcon for life, so thank you so much. Congratulations, Mr. Holiday, and as the parent of a Jordan student, well done. We will now continue with our Student of the Month recognitions for our June Student of the Month, coming to us from Hillside High School, where it is always a great evening, and I will call on Dr. William Logan. Great evening, everyone. Uh, it is certainly a pleasure to be here before you to present Licia Johnson. What better way to end the school year and to end this celebration than with an outstanding young woman who I've been impressed with uh, since her arrival in ninth grade. Uh, to be honest, I had already made, made up my mind last year when she was a junior about who I was gonna recommend for this honor. She was definitely gonna be my nominee in spite of the fact that anybody could have submitted these nominations. But just to tell you a little bit about Alicia, uh, she is a senior at Hillside High School uh, where she is a uh, member of our International Baccalaureate program. She currently maintains a 4.2 GPA grade point average. Uh, she's an honor student. And like I said, she's a candidate for the IB diploma uh, that would be presented to her this summer provided she meets all of the requirements. Uh, she is, uh, a well-rounded student affiliated with several organizations. Probably she's a member of Theta Phi Delta, where she is committed to service, uh, something that they stand for and represent through all of their activities. Uh, she's participated in numerous food drives, uh, raising money for students with uh, children with sickle cell uh, anemia across the state of North Carolina and volunteering at nursing homes. Uh, she certainly has the support of her family, and I'm glad to see uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson, who was probably behind her. I can't see from my perspective, but I know that they're standing behind her as always. Uh, again, what's notable, uh, what I believe is notable about Alicia is uh, her character. Uh, she's one of the most humble uh, individuals that I know, uh, considering the things that she's been able to accomplish uh, since she's been in high school. She's an eight-time state champion. Uh, in track and field, uh, and she has actually earned national titles in track and field as well. She's a seven-time All-American, as well as uh, being named MVP during the 2018-19 school year. Uh, I believe it was for the state of North Carolina or the conference. I can't remember which it was. Uh, she certainly exemplifies our model this school year, Hornets Hustle Hardest, 
And uh, again, uh, she has definitely been a delight to serve over the past four years. Uh, she definitely takes care of me as her principal by bringing me lunch. Uh, she'll share with me her fries uh, from Bojangles whenever she goes or if her mom cooks, she was always able to offer me food uh, when she's passing me in the halls or to give me an extra lemonade. And uh, that just shows to me uh, her care for others and uh, just her general commitment uh, to humanity. So it again, it's just it's a pleasure to be able to share with you, uh, Alicia Johnson, a senior here at Hillside High School. Congratulations, Alicia, and we would love for you to say a couple of words so we can see you and your family behind you. Good evening, everyone. I'm overwhelmed right now with all of this. Um, I do want to say thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Logan, for your love and support and just you being yourself and treat me like your own. Um, I'm shaking right now. Um, <laughs> I do want to say that I am going to University of South Carolina on a full ride scholarship to run track. And <laughs> um, one thing I can say is throughout my four years at Hillside, I felt like a big sister, you know, a great friend, a great leader to not just my teammates, but my classmates as well, and just students in the schools that I don't even know. And I just really appreciate it just like the love and support like now for me not being able to, you know, see some of my friends to be able to be in a school right now. I truly appreciate you all and just the, just me knowing that people recognize me and the things that I do throughout the four years that I've been there. And I just, one thing that Dr. Logan mentioned was I'm always humble. One thing about me is a lot of people know that, you know, I run track, but I don't, like both, I don't really talk about it a lot, but you know, the work pays off and just staying humble, staying humble and believing in myself and the God above, you know, I can do anything with him in my life. So I'm truly thankful and I can't wait for, you know, what God has for me in the future and just with my academics, you know, just everything overall. So I'm super excited and just really thankful for you guys as a whole, DPS, and my principal, and my staff, and just students, and my family as well, <laughs> and my sister upstairs, just thankful overall. Thank you, guys. Congratulations to our May and June Students of the Month for Durham Public Schools. And we are now going to go to our final celebration, and we're going to be recognizing a number of students who could not be with us physically, but have made an important contribution to uh, our entire school system, and specifically to our superintendent. This is the Superintendent Student Advisory Council. And to introduce them uh, and to celebrate them, I'd like to call on Dr. Nakia Hardy, our Deputy Superintendent. Good evening, board members, Dr. Mabinga. Um, I'm going to just share a few words. I'll turn it over to Dr. Mabinga, and then we will recognize our outstanding students. Exceptional, outstanding, brilliant. Just a few of the words that come to mind when I think about this year's representation from our Superintendent Student Advisory Council. Working with these students every year is truly an inspiring experience for all of us. It's my pleasure to introduce the members of the Superintendent Advisory Council to the board and to thank them for their dedication and service. Our members this year were very honest with the superintendent and administration. They provided us with feedback and suggestions on district initiatives, policies, and issues. They thought outside of the box and were exceptionally clear about what we needed to do to make DPS the best for each of them in terms of their legacy, but for the children that remain with us through K through 12. We're grateful for each member of our council and for the high school that they represented. We also want to take this opportunity to thank our high school principals for recommending such outstanding young people to represent their schools and school communities. 
and to our parents, our families, our caregivers for the support that you have provided to these wonderful children. They were outstanding. You ensure that they were able to make it to every meeting. They were picked up from every meeting and they really enjoyed the time that they spent together. And we just want to say thank you for sharing a part of your families with us so that we could learn from our children and our outstanding students. I am going to uh, read, I will read all of the names after some brief remarks from our superintendent. Um, I know many of them were unable to be with us today and hopefully they are, have the ability to, to watch this meeting via Zoom. We will definitely be mailing their certificates to them and we just wanna honor them and thank them um, for their service, but for just sharing that spark with us because we have we are much better because of our experience with our superintendent's advisory council this year. Dr. Mabinga. Thank you, Dr. Hardy, uh, for pretty much highlighting or pretty much cover everything about this particular group. Very, very impressive group of young folks. A uh, couple of topics that I would like to lift up uh, based on all the conversation that we have had with this group of students. Usually at the beginning of the meeting, we'll say, give us topics that you would like to, for us to discuss throughout the year. And one of the topics was about dress code or uniform. Uh, amazing how uh, they were able to highlight or bring up some of uh, the biases that uh, we had uh, when it comes to female versus male. So they were very impressive. And uh, we took the advice at heart and uh, that will also draft some of uh, the policies that uh, we will bring into the board. Another topic was about uh, equity when it comes to hiring uh, staff members. And uh, one of the ideas was uh, why can't you just hire centrally at the central office level and then start dispatching those teachers at the school level so you can have that balance. I said, um, that's good. Uh, you guys are thinking with outside of the bus, but uh, my principals will kill me because they are the one that have the authority to hire uh, for their school. So it's been really a pleasure having a really great conversation with these young folks. And uh, they know this and I said, everything that they're leaving us with and that's gonna make even DPS better. So a uh, very impressive group of young folks. Dr. Hardy, go ahead, proceed with names. I would like to recognize uh, at this time, recognize all of the students. There is also a photo um, a group photo that we will also um, share so that our viewers um, can see. From School for Creative Studies, we had Denia McLean and Tobiah Morrison Danner. From Durham School of the Arts, Deanna Parker and Nyala Harrison. From Hillside High School, Brian Harrison, Sierra Redden, and Jalen Hall. From Hillside New Tech, Samia Powell, and Sydney Gid Gilmore. From J.D. Clement Early College on the campus of North Carolina Central University, Elena Pettiford, Serenity Ellis, and Trinity Sheely. From Jordan High School, Anna Borowski and Kendall McDougall. From Lakeview, Courtney Moore and Jadia Godfrey. From Middle College on the campus of Durham Technical Community College. Kalori Cosme, Marla Valencia, and Marwa Barkery. From Northern High School, Karina Placinia Leos and Tanner Horton. From deep, excuse me, from PLC, Janiah Smith Sherman. From Riverside, Sherry Neela and Keo Tayakoski. From Southern, Colby Black, Talia Dawson, and Valeria Mesa Cano. Thank you so much to our, our students. We are so proud of you. To our seniors, we say congratulations as members of the class of 2020. We are proud of you and we look forward to all of the wonderful things that you will bring forward to our community, to our state, to our nation, and to our country. We are so proud of each of our, our students. Thank you. We're extraordinarily proud of them. I believe we have a picture that we're ready to, that we should be ready to show on a shared screen of the full uh, student, the superintendent's student advisory council. 
they were invited to watch the live stream at this time. So they are here to uh, receive the people's ovation and acclaim. So um, if the photo is not ready, uh, Mr. Lee, if you'd like to say a word of thanks to them, um, I would appreciate that. Absolutely. I am so happy to have to be able to thank you all for the work you've you've done over this year. I always hear about what the super superintendent student advisory council says. They say this, they say that, and they all it always comes back to us. And Dr. Mubenga is always so excited after he meets with you all because you got you all give him an insight on what we need on the ground. You guys tell us what's what's happening in the schools. You tell us what you need and how to make your lives better. And that's what we do. That's that's what we need um, as board members and as a superintendent to be able to do that. Just this celebration in itself with um, Alicia and Chris and the student, the student advisory council, the superintendent student advisory council, that just reminds us, you know, whenever we get to hear this, it just reminds us how great our students are, how we're preparing students for leadership. This, you know, we have champions here. We have we have schools with uh, with students with unbelievable amounts of um, the un unbelievable amounts of scholarships. We raise leaders, the world tomorrow's leaders for the world, and I'm so excited to just say thank you, thank you to the student of the month for May and June. Thank you for the as you see the picture that we're showing here to the superintendent's advisory council, student advisory council. You guys make the difference. You guys make Durham proud. Remember, uh, once you, when you start here, you can go anywhere, but always remember you're here from Durham, Durham Public Schools. And just by doing that, you're already prepared for leadership and for greatness. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate your work. Mr. Lee, that concludes the celebrations for tonight, and I yield up the floor. All right. That is awesome. I always love our celebrations. Uh, I always absolutely love our celebrations. Congratulations to Ms. Bowman. Um, uh, every time I go to Lucas, I see her smiling, and I have to go pick up Nicholas from after school. She's doing the dance. She's teaching the step team. So it's always excellent to see her there. And thank you, Ms. Sanchez. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Thank you, everyone, for coming in and um, uh, participating in the celebrations. That is an exciting part of our meeting. So thank you as well, Chip. Okay, the next item on our agenda is a superintendent's update. I will pass it to Dr. Mubenka. Thank you, Chairman Lee, members of the board and our community at large. Let me take this uh, wonderful opportunity just to say thank you to our class of 2020. I know as uh, we're going to start tomorrow celebrating our students, especially for the specialty high school, they're going to have their graduation tomorrow. It's not what they were anticipating when they became seniors. So I just want to affirm to our families as well as our students, our principals as well, central office, we're doing the best we can to celebrate you, to honor you, and to give you the best as we're going to push you up to go to your next level. I've received several emails from students that really wanted the traditional graduation. And my response to our students today is pretty much, we heard you. I wish I was in a position of giving you what you wanted. But I trust us, we have looked at all the options possible to be in compliance with law and make sure that we are also ensuring that your safety is first. But regardless of the decision that we came up with, that may not be approved by all, but deeply from our hearts, we just wanted to express our gratitude for all 13 years that you have spent with DPS. We really wanna celebrate you. So with that being said, 
as we're looking forward for our next year, I know it's going to be a challenging year. As experts are telling us what the year may look like. I just want to show to our community and to our board members as well, we have a strong, a very effective task force in place. We're not leaving anything. We're putting everything on the table to explore options. We're thinking outside of the box to make sure that our students, they're gonna continue learning as well as we're taking care of their safety. Parents, community members, trust us every single day. We are thinking, we are brainstorming what will be the best environment when it comes to learning for our students. And I hope our state, from the guidance of our State Board of Education, they're gonna give us quick guidance, especially when it comes to how many days that we're gonna be in school, whether or not virtual learning is gonna be a part of that so that we can kind of expedite the process on how schools are going to look like next year. And I'm gonna take this opportunity as well as we are really pushing for one-to-one -one devices. We really wanna be in a better place. And there are going to be folks that's never been a part of DPS. They've been homeschooling. They've been in private schools. And we just want to invite everyone. DPS, we're here. We are for everyone. We're gonna make sure that we're gonna accommodate every person, whether there's options, whether it's going to be personal learning, things of that nature, DPS is well equipped to make sure we are addressing the learning of all our students. With that few remarks, I'm going to pass on to my staff. They have a PowerPoint. I think the order of the presentation is gonna start with Mr. Lassier, then Dr. Mark, then the last one will be Dr. Hardy. Thank you. Good evening, board members, Dr. Mabenga. Um, if we could bring up the PowerPoint, please. As we begin, uh, as we wait for the PowerPoint to come up, um, talking about fiscal update in regards to COVID-19, um, we just wanted to bring to your attention uh, the expenses that were occurring. And uh, every time we do a presentation, we're gonna have more expenses the next time because this is not stopping. So we could go to two, two more slides. As we look at the instructional materials uh, for students that we've done three phases of deployment of uh, materials to the students. First phase, 55,600. Second phase was our largest phase of 240,000. And our third phase uh, that went out uh, the week before last and uh, this past week uh, ended up being another 97,000. With that said, in instructional materials that we've sent to the to students, $392,600 has been spent overall. As we talk about operations, um, the biggest piece of what the operations area has done is working with the Food Insight Group and the other groups that are working on providing meals to families and students. We've spent so far 674,000 plus dollars in that regard. Uh, also on the operation side, as we look um, at what we've spent, we've spent $80,000, a little over $80,000 for mostly um, mask and cleaning supplies. In that regard, we spent uh, $50,000 for the mailing of those three phases. So instructional materials and Supplies, postage costs, we've spent about $522,000 in total so far. And with the, in the, the money we're providing for meals, right now we're up to one point, almost $1.2 million in expenses uh, at this point in time. Uh, we have 
probably another $250,000 that we'll be spending for meals uh, in the next few weeks um, and other supplies and materials that we'll be purchasing as we move forward. Um, but that is our fiscal update for today in regards to COVID-19. And I'll pass on uh, to Dr. Monk on the operation side. Thank you, Mr. Lesore. We could go one more slide, please. Thank you. Um, so good evening, board, Dr. Mabanga. Uh, we will be initiating our summer feeding program beginning Monday, the June, June the 8th, and it will last through July the 31st. Uh, we will be continuing with the 24 sites that we've opened as a part of Durham Feast that should provide a certain amount of continuity for our families. The schedule for those days will remain the same. Um, we will also continue on with providing multiple meals at uh, each time that we serve. Um, one of the changes from last year from the summer feeding program would be we are not extending it to other programs just yet. Um, those would have been our community organizations that we partnered with in the past because we don't know um, exactly what our uh, capacity will be this summer both as it relates to uh, the food itself, as well as our human resources that we anticipate to return on June the 1st. Um, in order to make sure that there's no gap in service, um, until we are up and running on June the 8th, we will continue uh, our partner with Food Insight Group. They will continue to produce the meals and we will serve the students between uh, June 1st and June 8th. And then once June 8th arrives, we will start producing and serving the meals ourselves. With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Hardy. Thank you, Dr. Monk. You can go to the next slide, please. Wanted to provide our board and our community an update regarding our summer programming. So the next few slides take us through the summer programs and provide an update in terms of if these programs due to our current status with COVID-19 have been canceled, if we're rescheduling or repurposing um, this particular initiative for when we um, were to reopen um, later this year. So our elementary um, early literacy program that has been canceled. Read to Achieve, um, we, those funds were initially deployed to all of our LEAs um, um, to help with the COVID response. There are going to be some summer funds. They're gonna be called summer jump funds that will be used for grades kindergarten through fourth grade. And so we have begun some preliminary planning. Um, we are waiting to receive additional state guidance um, in terms of other options for how we can definitely serve those students using those particular funds. Extended school year from our special education uh, department, we will be providing extended school year for our for some of our students. And they are already working on preliminary planning um, to provide those services um, remotely. Our ESL Newcomer Academy, um, it will be canceled for the summer, but what we are doing is doing some preliminary planning for how we can provide additional support to those students and families um, when students return to school. Next slide, please. Our high school credit options uh, and back on track, we will provide that programming for our high school students. It will be provided remotely um, this summer. Take two has been canceled. Spark has been canceled. And then our Summer Scholars AP Camp, that program will continue remotely in terms of providing our students with opportunities and preparation for taking AP courses in the fall. Next slide, please. Our two uh, summer programs that are also um, co-sponsored by Duke University, our environmental summer science uh, program, as well as the Young Scholar Summer Research Institute have both been canceled. Our CDM, which allows students to receive credit by demonstrated mastery, we are doing some preliminary planning um, for the remote opportunities to work with some of our students. And we are still awaiting some additional guidance for specific courses from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Camp EPIC, which is a program that we have provided last summer for our students who are in transition, that will be canceled for this summer. However, we will use that funding to provide additional tutoring and support to our students and families when we return. Next slide, please. 
As Mr. Lesur mentioned, we have distributed and or mailed our uh, phase three instructional resources and just wanna thank um, our curriculum and instruction team, um, our warehouse department, our principals, truly a collaborative effort and just appreciate everyone in helping us make sure our students had resources to continue learning. We have finalized grading communication and are working um, to make sure that our teachers have additional information for um, that they will in, that they will insert in power school to communicate with our families at the end of the year. Uh, finalizing all of the logistical details uh, for our June graduations, we will have our small high school graduations this Thursday. We are also working very closely with Dr. Monk and our operations team to make sure all of our end of the year closeout plans are being finalized and any additional resources um, during this time you can find on our Ignite website, ignite.dpsnc.net. This time we will, um, I will turn it back over to Dr. Mavinga. Thank you so much. Chairman Lee, members of the board, that's pretty much con conclude our presentations. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Mabenga and staff. I appreciate your update. The next item on our agenda is agenda review and approval. I do, I will make note that Dr. Mabenga has asked that we move uh, the consent item for year round calendar off of the consent agenda. We'll move that um, just above number nine. And I guess that would be academic services. We'll make that an academic services right after uh, consent agenda. Okay, are there any other updates? All right, I'll accept a motion to, ex to approve the agenda as amended. I moved. Second. It's been moved, moved by Ms. Byer and seconded by Ms. Fort Brown. Uh, that we approve the agenda as amended. I will do a roll call vote. Uh, please temporarily unmute. You can use the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself uh, and uh, vote as you please. Natalie Byer. Aye. Bettina Umstead. Aye. Xavier Kaysan. Aye. Steve Unruh. Aye. Matt Sears. Aye. Many Fort Brown. Aye. It passes unanimously. The chair votes aye as well. The agenda is approved as amended. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the Board of Education minutes dated April 23rd, 2020. Move approval. Second. Has been moved and proper. Has been moved by Natalie Byer and seconded by Steve Underwood uh, that we approve the Board of Education minutes dated April twenty third, twenty twenty. Uh, what say you, Ms. Byer? Aye. Bettina Umstead. Aye. Mr. Kaysen. Aye. Mr. Underwood. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Mrs. Fort Brown. The chair votes aye as well, passes unanimously. Next time on our agenda is general public comment. Um, we will, I believe, uh, Chip, how many public comment uh, submissions do we have? We have six public comment submissions and uh, I believe we have enough time to go through them all without yes, amendment. Okay, very good. We will read public comment as submitted by 5 p.m. today. And I will turn it over to Chip to read our public comments. Thank you. Uh, the first comment is by Shelby Kennedy of Lauren Lane in Durham. I'd just like to honor Dr. Bell for her service as our leader. As an EC teacher and as a parent of a child with special needs, her leadership as EC director has been priceless. It is unfortunate, in my opinion, that this district is choosing to transfer, transfer her from EC. This is where her expertise lies. Over many years as a coordinator, her work with the Hill Center and as our director for the past 10 years, as well as the elected president of the State Board of EC Directors in North Carolina. I'm sure Dr. Bell will excel in her next role as well, but both parents and teachers, as well as the district as a whole, will be, by choice, missing out on a wealth of experience. Comment number two is from Sandy Earhart of Mount Hermon Church Road. 
I, as well as many others, follow and support Dr. Bell. Please put her back in her position so we can support and meet the needs of the EC students in DPS. Comment number three is from Deborah Isley Rogelia from Sunny Court in Durham. To the members of the Board of Education, I ask you to please carefully reconsider the reassigning of Kristen Bell. Dr. Bell has been an effective and compassionate advocate for the Department of Exceptional Children. She has dedicated her life to serving EC children, their families, and the teachers and staff who work with them. It will be very difficult to replace someone who, with her knowledge, skills, empathy, and leadership qualities. Again, I ask you all to please consider reconsider this reassignment. Thank you for your service. Comment number four is from Courtney O'Dell of Watts Street. Dear respected members of DPS Board of Education, as an exceptional children's teacher in Durham Public Schools, I'm writing again to, to express my concerns regarding the removal of Dr. Bell from the Executive Director of the Exceptional Children's Program. During the previous Board of Education meeting, the public comments were not read, thus making myself and many others feel like our concerns were not heard. The administration has not answered any questions or concerns related to this change. I would expect that a change this drastic would have considerable reasoning behind it, and I would love to know why this is happening now. It is not only imperative for our students to receive consistent support, but the exceptional educators who are expect, expected to teach them during this unprecedented time. I'm greatly concerned about what this change will do to our current EC community. Dr. Bell is the foundation to our exceptional children's department and we need her leadership. The timing of this change and the withholding of information from devoted staff demonstrates the lack of support our current administration has for our exceptional children's department. I challenge you again to ask yourselves if this abrupt decision is what's best for our most vulnerable students. Thank you so much for your thoughtful consideration of this matter and your hard work. Comment number five comes from Heather Gee of Colony Woods Drive in Apex. Dr. Kristen Bell has been a strong and dependable advocate for students with special needs for over a decade for Durham Public Schools. Her dedication to students across the district is tangible with the thoughtful responses she gives to staff and families alike. She is an ally for students, parents, and teachers. Change in her position would be a regretful move which will cause irreparable harm to students across the district. Through numerous policy changes, program changes, and overturn of other staff members, Dr. Bell has been a steadfast beacon in the sea of public education. Dr. Bell must remain at the top leadership position of EC services. And the final comment is from Julie Fox of Silo Drive in Chapel Hill. I would like to share my concern regarding the proposed change in leadership of the EC department. During this difficult time related to the COVID-19 pandemic, there are so many fears, challenges, changes, and unknowns for all of us. Removing a strong leader such as Dr. Kristen Bell in the midst of this national crisis and the impact on our community only adds to the confusion. We need a leader who can be, help us as we manage through these changes, who understands the strength and needs of our students, and who places what is the right thing for these students as primary, who knows the law and how it applies to EC services, and who is a positive and supportive leader to her staff. Dr. Bell is trusted by her colleagues, her staff, and the families of her EC students. The idea that Dr. Bell will not be here to guide us as we move through these unknown times adds an extra level of concern for all of us. I urge you to do everything you can to keep Dr. Bell as our Executive Director of EC Services. Thank you. Mr. Chair, that completes the public comment. Thank you very much for reading those, Chip. We will, um, uh, will we also have those posted on the website or, um, Yes, they, the recording of it. They will be they will be report re, pre, they will be printed as an as a PDF on the website. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, so that is it for general public comment. The next item on our agenda is the consent items. The consent items that are currently in our consent agenda are Hillside High School new singular wireless lease renewal stadium light antenna, Pearson Town Elementary School American Tower lease. Um, renewal of monopole, and then the K K five literacy contracts. Those three are on the consent agenda. Um, what does the board feel? I move that we approve the items on the consent agenda. A second. That's been moved by Ms. Umstead and seconded by Mr. Kaysen that we approve the items on the consent agenda. Uh, will the roll call vote again? Ms. Beyer. Aye. Sorry. Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Kaysen. Aye. Mr. Unruh. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Fort Brown. Aye. The chair votes aye as well. Passes unanimously. The next item on our agenda is um, 
educational services. Um, we have the year round calendar 2020 discussion that was moved off of consent. I will turn it over to Dr. Hardy, our Deputy Superintendent for Educational Services. Good evening again, board members, Dr. Herbinga, Chairman Lee. Um, Ms. Smith is going to um, pull up our presentation and I will uh, go through that briefly. Um, also in the board materials for our community and our public uh, is posted the presentation. In addition to the presentation, we also have posted the, uh, the year round calendar with the days. Um, tonight, we are bringing forward um, for discussion and for approval um, to our board tonight, the previously board approved year round calendar. This calendar is aligned to the new legislation due to our response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. This slide shows the new legislative requirements that were applied to our year round calendar. You will see five additional days must be added to the student year and five existing days must be deemed as remote learning days. In addition, we also must maintain our 215 day calendar for our staff and our calendar includes the state number of work days, annual leave days and holidays. I would also like to note that in our calendar, um, as previously discussed, when we brought forward our original calendars for the upcoming academic year. We have included holidays for uh, Yom Kippur and Eid, as well as the other required holidays. And so just wanted to make sure that our community and our families um, are aware of that um, when they see the calendar that is posted on the website. Next slide, please. We, thank you. Um, we use um, 1,025 hours when creating our calendar. Our board approved calendar previously for the 2020-21 year round calendar had 181 student days. With the new requirements, the year round calendar will now have 186 student days. The revised year round draft presented tonight was created in collaboration with all five Durham Public Schools year round principals and shared with all of our staff at those schools for feedback. This draft is aligned to the North Carolina calendar legislation and continues to maintain a, a semblance, not exactly um, of a typical year round calendar to include our intercession breaks. It was important to our year-round community to continue a structure that has breaks uh, as much as possible to serve as a factor for our families that have opted to enroll in our year-round schools. Next slide, please. This is just a brief summary of the significant, some of the significant dates within the revised calendar. What you can see is that our first teacher workday will begin in July. Our first student day would be August 3rd. Our spring intercession days would be March 22nd through April 4th. Our final student day would be June 4th and our final teacher work day would be June 7th. I also would like to note some of the other holidays just um, for those of you um, who are viewing the calendar on the web. We have also included, as I mentioned, uh, Yom Kippur. That is going to be a work day on September 28th. Veterans Day, November 11th. And Eid is scheduled for, as a work day on May 13th. At this time, um, we will open it up for questions and discussion. This is before the board tonight for approval. Um, we also will be working with our communities and Dr. Mabinga to bring forward um, revised traditional calendars as well. Those revised traditional calendars will need to follow the upcoming legislation, um, which has a start date of August 17th. However, due to the earlier start date with year round, we wanted to bring this forward um, as soon as possible with feedback from our principals and our staffs um, to the board for discussion and approval. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the floor to uh, questions. I see many with their hand up. <clears throat> You're still on mute, Manny. Okay. <laughs> 
There you are. Uh, I can get back to the screen. I have a new mouse. Um, Dr. Hardy, I wanted to make sure that we let our public know that you have you and your team have made a conscious effort to make sure that year round and traditional will have spring break at the same time. Thank you so much, Ms. Fort Brown. And I also um, did not introduce Ms. Jamie Stroud, who's our Director of School Innovation, who works to coordinate all of our calendars with our principals. Um, I apologize. And Ms. Fort Brown, absolutely. We know as a fundamental um, discussion that we have had um, um, with our communities that we would want our spring breaks to align. So when we bring forward the um, traditional calendar that will begin and our recommendation on August 17th, we will ensure that that recommendation will include an alignment between the March, excuse me, the spring intercession um, that is denoted on the year round calendar that begins March 22nd and goes through April 5th. Thank you so much for that reminder. Okay, are there any other questions from board members? I'm looking um, for any hands raised. Okay, Natalie. I just wanted to thank you all for um, including those holidays and um, really including a variety of holidays that are represented in our calendar. I think that's so important for our entire community. Um, do we have the flexibility? Some, some folks have been talking during pandemic times of year round being actually a better learning environment and calendar for all children going forward as we dream what we would want with calendar flexibility. Does DPI give us the flexibility if in the future, maybe a year or two from now, we wanted to move more schools to year round? Do you know if we even have that flexibility? Yes, we do have that flexibility. So yeah, what, what level of flexibility is that? You know, to, if we said, you know, in order to make things balanced, because we can here, Every school goes a year round. Do we have that kind of flexibility or do we have this the flexibility of pick and choose a few? I mean, what you know, flexibility can be translated a couple of different ways. Let me make a few comments here. I know Dr. Hart is going to jump in. As we have that flexibility because of COVID-19, we also got to keep in mind uh, transportation can be a nightmare if you bring all the schools uh, to year round. So all those options they're on the table and uh, we're talking about those and uh, we got to make sure that operation is well academic they're matching together okay i was only asking just you know at the very beginning we said all things were on ta on the table and i was just trying to understand what to what extent all things were on the table and so uh, i do know there would be um, concerns but that is something i've heard kind of floating around what if all schools just went to year round now you know, to try to make up for some of that time. So I thought I would ask. And so thank you for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Anyone else? Any other thoughts, concerns? All right. So the other thank question is, sorry, sorry to before we brush off of this real quick. Um, everybody is very concerned and, and trying to figure out same thing as Wake County starting in your round. The fact that we're bringing this calendar as a modified does not mean we've reached a decision on reopening or any of those things. It just happens to be on our agenda tonight. I just wanted to be clear that there's still so much work that you all are doing um, as we evaluate reopening. Right, thank you for that clarification. That is a very important point. Uh, there's still a lot of moving pieces here. All right, I think that is just for information, correct? Of that, do we vote on that? That's it. Actually, it is before That's you action. Um, okay. and okay. would appreciate um, a motion for approval. Okay, approval. The calendar is presented. I will second. All right, it's been moved by Mr. Unruh, seconded by Mr. Kesa. I'll, um, it's been properly moved and seconded, and I will do a roll call vote again, uh, Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Unruh. Aye. Ms. Byer. Aye. Mr. Kaysen. Aye. Ms. Fort Brown. Aye. 
Mr. Sayers. The chair, I need to uh, come off mute. Probably. Yeah. Aye. The chair also votes aye, it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is from the Chief of Staff, 7000B Policies, first reading. Thank you. Uh, board member, good evening, board members, Chairman Lee, Dr. Mabenga. Ms. Smith, would you please pull up the PowerPoint? And while we're waiting for that, I just wanted to share some information regarding our policy transition project with the board. We have completed the Spanish translations of the relevant policies for um, through the 3000s, and I am working closely with um, Mr. Friedman with the Multilingual Resource Center to make sure that those policies are shared and disseminated with our Spanish-speaking families and accessible on our website. So we should have those posted. And obviously, in light of COVID, there's, it's been a little bit of a delay. But we should have those posted for our families, um, certainly in the next month. So we're really excited about that. And we will continue to send the policies to be translated as they are adopted by this board. As I indicated before, we're through the 3500s on those translated policies. I also wanted to share that the 7000A policies that the board adopted on April 23rd have been uploaded and are currently on our uh, web hosted site. So those are easily accessible for our stakeholders, staff and families as well. Next slide, please. The first policy, well, let me also share that the policy working group for this section of policies consisted of Bettina Umstead, Steve Unruh, and Xavier Kaysen. Rassi Atkins and Jeff Kowik were the administrators that assisted us with processing these policies. And we met uh, via Zoom and went over all of the policies on May 5th. After that meeting, we determined there were several areas that we wanted to bring to the full board for additional discussion. And I believe Mr. Kowik should be on here. If not, I know Ms. Atkins is. But the first policy, 7540, voluntary shared leave. We wanted some clarification from the full board regarding the language that is highlighted on the screen, exhausted all earned leave. And I believe Mr. Kowik or Ms. Atkins, if you could explain what you're, you need from the board regarding this language. Hi, good evening, everyone. So, I, and I'm gonna, I think uh, Mr. Kowik is on, so he, he is here to raise this here. Here he is. Oh, okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> all right, sorry about that. Good, good evening, everyone. Um, so the policy language that's highlighted in there talks about um, when employees who need to be out uh, uh, for medical reasons um, and using voluntary shared leave, or otherwise known as donated leave, the current policy language that's highlighted, it says that before able to access donated leave from coworkers or family members, um, that they have to exhaust all the earned leave. Now, the reason we're bringing this up is that there is earned leave. Um, teachers um, and those classified as classroom teachers, um, they actually earn leave personal leave, which comes with a $50 a day deduction um, if they take it primarily and they need to have a, sub, a substitute teacher on that day. So if we leave the language as is, where it says exhaust all earned leave, that means employees uh, teachers are going to have to exhaust their personal leave um, before they're able to access donated leave, which they get at full pay. Um, so they, so that's, do we want to consider the question here is, do we want to um, either, you know, change how we're classifying extended sick leave as is in the slide here, or just change the language to exhaust all earned leave at full pay um, before being able to access donated leave? So board members, we would um, welcome any feedback and guidance. Uh, the working group did discuss it and they did agree that it needed to come before the full board for full discussion. I guess Jeff, maybe do you have a recommendation for the board? That may help. Well, it's certainly um, the recommendation that I would make is if it's it's certainly more advantageous for our instructional personnel if they can access the voluntary shared leave 
without first having to go on their own earned leave for which they don't earn full pay. So, um, so that's the, the proposal brought to the board is to change the language to allow employees to use all um, both entitled and unentitled full pay leave before they need to exhaust um, leave for which they don't get. I, I, if I could speak here, I, I believe the committee was in favor of making that change. We just wanted to bring it to the full board so the full board would be aware of the change. But uh, I thought we were, at least I was pretty clearly uh, in favor of making that change. And I thought the committee was. Um, that's my fault, uh, Mr. Unruh. I was not clear on that when we um, ended that meeting. So I apologize. But I think that- um, that's well, no, I think you're. I think you're correct. I think we wanted the full board to see that, but um, but I do think we were prepared to, to recommend that we make the change. Okay. Well, it makes sense. So if, if we're waiting on a motion, I move that we accept the recommendation of the committee that worked on voluntary shared leave to include their recommendation. I'm waiting on a second. I, I would second. I just didn't know if we were doing these one by one. I was just, yeah. I think for this one, we can uh, probably do that because there was some confusion. And that would assist us as we go through these. Okay, so there was a second. So we do have an official motion on the board, on the, uh, before us. Uh, so it's been moved by Ms. Fort Brown and seconded by Ms. Byer that we approve the, um, the panel's recommendation to change the word in here um, as presented. Uh, is there any further discussion on this? I don't think it's really as present as discussed, maybe. It's not like discussed, on the slide, yeah. right? I don't know. I just... right. Well, yeah, I think it was I thought I think it was it was discussed, but they thought it was going to be presented here and the, the change in wording. So we'll say as discussed. Um, with the change, the, with the recommendation by Ms. Coweek, Mr. Coweek, um, I'll, I'll, we'll say that. And so, um, that's the discussion. Is there any further discussion on this topic? All right. Let me see how we're going to do this here. All right. I think I know everybody's name by now. Uh, all right. I'm going to uh, do a roll call vote. Uh, Mr. Kaysen. Aye. Uh, Ms. Olmstead? Aye. Mr. Unruh? Aye. Mr. Sears? Aye. Ms. Byer? Aye. Ms. Fort Brown? Aye. Uh, I did Mr. Case on first, and the chair votes aye as well, so it passes unanimously this, this, um, this policy. We have more policies to talk about, correct? Yes. We do. Okay. Please um, share again. Um, Beth, if you could bring the PowerPoint back up, please. The next policy, I'll start talking about it, is the 7600. It is not a standard policy in the NCSBA manual, but it is a Durham policy. Next slide, please. It is has been a Durham policy for several years, and it is the living wage policy. It is our recommendation that we include language addressing this. First, we would change it from shall to may, that we would increase um, any living wage rates and that that would be determined based on the superintendents uh, consulting with the finance department regarding insufficiency in funding or any other financial exigencies. We do feel that, um, I know that the working group felt strongly about the policy um, making sure that it was included um, in our new manual, but we also wanted to make sure that the, it did allow for um, an understanding that in the event that our budget would not sustain that for some reason, that it would be, give the superintendent the opportunity to make sure we were being fiscally responsible while, st while still stating the desires of the board to provide the living wage rate. Has any is there any, I welcome any questions regarding the proposed language in red that would be added to the policy? If none, then we can move to the next slide. 
I'm sorry, I was raising my hand, but I, uh, yeah, I must have been on a different screen. I appreciate, and maybe was going to hear from many. I mean, this policy goes back to when Minnie, Heidi, and Steve Shul were first on the board together, and it is something that Durham really led school districts across the state in. I'm, I'm troubled by this because it feels like we're watering it down, and I know we're in a pandemic, but... This is not a $15 an hour. This is a living wage, which is, right now is about $12.47 an hour. I I don't like that we're proposing watering it down. I guess I'd welcome hearing from others what, why y'all think it needs to be. It just. Um, so are you saying we're watering it down by saying a living wage, or are you saying it should be $15 an hour? Because I think, uh, at least in my my belief on this is, if we leave it at living wage and that moves up, you know, we'll then it'll be our policy to move up in that living wage. It's kind of like a variable, right? If we put $15 in here, right, $15 an hour, then it's kind of $15 an hour, right? Or, or what is it that you feel that is a watering the, down? Yeah, no, I don't, I'm not th saying we should have any specific rate. But changing the shall to a may is is softer legal language. I mean, we've got a lawyer on the line. That's in Tanya, you're a lawyer. That's that's softened. It's not shall. Shall is stronger. So and the and the language in red that says, well, if times get tough. Right. I, I don't like it. I agree with you, Natalie. And and um, the fact that it, it feels like we're we are backpedaling and saying, okay, well, we may not, maybe times get hard. Like Natalie said, we can't pay it. So we're going to let the superintendent decide, you know, I like what we had. That is that, that living wage rate, which will be provided by the Durham. I can only see part of my screen. County manager must be calculated by July 1st. I think that, I think that gives an order. It gives it, it gives us something to say, this is what we're supposed to do. Now, whether we got it, whether we did it or not, because we haven't gotten to that yet. We haven't gotten to what Durham County pays and what Durham City pays. We haven't gotten there yet. But that is what our policy says. And I'd like to I'd like to stay there. The three elected bodies are all supposed to be on the same page. Well, so I would like to go back to the language that was in the original document as well. Uh, Mr. Chair. Please, Mr. Runway. Uh, a couple of things. Um, first, the we are actually paying a living wage. We're, we're not paying what the city and county pay. That's true, but we are paying a, a living wage. We're not paying enough, and that's clear. I think the what the committee was looking at was uh, the, the the commitment has to be shared by by every school board, and we did not want to lock a future school board into a, a budget decision that that they should make uh, based on whatever their their their, their uh, financial situation. Especially, we you know we were meeting at the time when the economy was shutting down. And so that was the, our concern was about locking a superintendent and a school board into a, uh, a future where they didn't have any control over part of their budget. That was the, it was not backing away from the commitment. The commitment's a political commitment and that's up to, a, up to board members to meet that commitment. I think this board uh, has made that effort. I think a future board will make that effort. Uh, but we don't know what the economy is going to be. We don't know what the economy is going to be in the next couple of years. Uh, and we that, that was the background to the decision. Well, that's backpedaling, Steve. That That is backpedaling because it's not a commitment. And regardless of what, what the, what the uh, economy is, there have to be some standards that we have. And, it's, and it is locking a, another board into it. That's right. That's what we do with every policy. We we make a we make a statement and we say this is what needs to happen and we lock that board in. Now if they come by and change it, that's on them. But this is what we say. This is the standard we set. 
And I think I think that's important. Anything less than that, it's backpedaling. Okay. Any other discussion? Any other comments? I can't see everyone, so please speak up if you if you do have comments. I can't see everyone uh, on my screen. Okay, I'm going to hear that as none. We can. Um, so there seems to be some uh, difference opinion, difference of opinions here. Do we need to vote on this one individually as well, Ms. Giovanni? Yes, I think it would be um, helpful because the other policy is going to require some additional conversation also. Okay. Uh, how many more policies do we have? One more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Natalie. Yeah, I, would, I would make a motion that we approve policy 7600 living wage without any of the red text and the word shall restored. Second. Okay. So the motion on the the motion which has been properly seconded is on the table to approve uh, policy 7600, removing all red text and restoring shall in the policy. Um, okay, any further discussion on this? Okay, Mr. Kaysen. Yeah, I'll just say I'll be voting no on that because the first sentence does not change the policy. It says it is the policy to pay a living wage. It just gives the person gives the superintendent a way to maneuver that to make that happen. So I will be I will be voting no. Okay. Okay. All right. So we will go. Um, I will do a roll call. Vote. All right, since Mr. Kaysen made his vote known, I'll just make it official. Mr. Kaysen. Nay. Mr. Unruh? No. Ms. Byer? Aye. Ms. Fort Brown? Aye. Ms. Umstead? Nay. Mr. Sears? Nay. The vote chair, the, the chair votes nay as well. It it um, is voted down uh, five to two. Um, I'll accept another motion. I'll make a motion to approve policy 7600 as recommended by the administration. Second. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Hold on, I'll have discussion. I'll, I'll ask for discussion here in a moment. Okay. Um, uh, it's been moved and properly seconded uh, that we approve uh, policy 7600 as presented here, which is uh, recommended by the administration. Any further discussion? Natalie. So I do not want to belabor the point, and I do not want to box in uh, future administrations, but I will note that this policy only applies to full-time employees. The living wage rate flexes, I think, as the economy flexes up and down. And um, when we are a district that has some employees making upwards of $100,000, but most of our custodians and bus drivers and cafeteria and child nutrition folks do not. I think it's really important for us to just codify that we're going to do that. We commit to do that as a board. We honor that. And, you know, I'd rather us have get to the point where we have to have like fewer people, you know, doing the work and pay those people as well as we can. If, it, if, if financial times come to that, I just, I, I don't, I, I'm not quite sure why we're in a different place about this policy being so aspirational and needing to stay aspirational. I'm, I'm not hearing, besides that we're in a pandemic panic, I think we still have to advocate, advocate for what our people need. And, and if we're not doing it for the people that are at the living wage policy, I, I don't know. I don't. 
I agree with you, Natalie. And so if, if we're going in that way, then we should make that same kind of adjustment for central office staff. We should make that adjustment for all, 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 all teachers that when, when the times get hard, then we're going to look at salaries and we're going to roll back because see now you're not doing it for that. And this is not going to bid well in, in, in the community. Guys, don't be scared. Don't be scared. And I'll say again be that the, be courageous in your leadership. And, and I will say again that the aspiration is in the first sentence. The mechanics are the parts that are in red. It is the mechanics, not the aspiration or the intent. That's my. Can opinion. we have the? I'm sorry. Can we have the slide back, Nicole, while Mr. Kaysen is speaking? I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Since you were referring to it, Doctor uh, Mr. Kaysen, yeah, uh, I wanted to make sure it's back on the screen. Yeah, I was just saying that the aspiration is as it always has been in that first sentence. The changes are in the mechanics, in my opinion, just to how you get to that point. I just, I'll, I'm in agreement with Mr. Case, and I don't see anything that backs away from the commitment. Uh, the commitment's there. We're all, we're all, and we've proved that we're in favor of it by, by acting on it. So I, I don't see why we have to prove it again. Uh, but I think our policies should be realistic in, in, in how they work, as well as aspirational. And the aspiration is, it couldn't be clearer. The first sentence states what the policy is. Uh, and, you know, and we all have shown time after time that we're committed to that. Mr. Malone, can you chime in on the difference between just changing that shall to a may? I mean... <laughs> Maybe I'm reading it wrong entirely as a non-attorney. Well, no, you're not. It's, you know, I was just reading it yet again to see if there's something I was missing. But obviously, you should think about it this way. Um, if the policy stays as is, the superintendent is required to make adjustments so that the employees receive the wage. If you change it to May, the superintendent on his or her own can decide whether or not to make the adjustments in spite of the fact that the board's first sentence says that you're going to pay a living wage. So you effectively hand to the superintendent the ability to decide whether or not to comply with the first sentence if you change it to May. I think, Rod, um, I would clarify that, though. It says in the language, and I don't have a dog in this fight. I'm just presenting the policies. But it says if after consulting with the finance officer. So I don't think it's just a question of the superintendent saying. Uh, I, I don't have I don't, that. I only have this piece here. I'm sorry. Oh, OK. Well, at the bottom. So I think it's. Oh, just, I'm sorry. So the OK, I'm sorry. So the red the, would be added also then. Is that the plan? Correct. So it would be if the finance officer said to the superintendent that we were in this district was in dire straits. I think it would, I don't imagine this happening. I think it was just the, when we proposed the language was in the event that we are in some God awful situation that instead of saying we're gonna raise these and possibly I think the fear was that we had is that people may be losing their jobs. If we say we're gonna increase it, but we're experiencing financial difficulties, we felt that it would be better to give the superintendent and the finance officer the option, and then they would still bring it to the board. I mean, I think that there's still the board, if the superintendent said it, I think the board can still say that that's not what they wanna do, but we don't wanna handcuff um, the superintendent and possibly have to um, people to lose their jobs in order to maybe meet this. I think that this was just kind of, because it is policy, we wanna be aspirational, but we also wanted to make sure that we were protecting uh, people as well. Right, but I, I don't think, I, I guess my, point would be that I don't read the I don't read the second bullet as prohibiting the superintendent from adjusting or from from not adjusting otherwise it, it I mean it's not um, I don't think, I mean, I understand what it's attempting to do, but I don't think that the sentence as written, at least I don't, I don't have the whole sentence here, but I'm not sure that I would take the May 
in the first sentence and then the separate sentence that says the superintendent shall not adjust. I mean, I view that as kind of a separate statement that separate from his May, separate from the May in the in the second sentence above, you, you know, there's a second statement that you shall not adjust the pay plan if after consulting the things below are occurring, not that the May, it, I don't think it limits the May, it's just a, a statement. So if it's intended to limit the May to just those conditions, um, you know, we should probably change it slightly in, in one spot or the other. Right, so- Mr. Malone, are you, are you, um, you can't see the entire uh, document here because we could take it off of presentation mode to make the, to kind of bring it in so you can see it all. Are you having, are, can you not see the bottom? I can only see or a significant decline in the board's financial resources that compels a reduction in the school system's current operational budget. That may be all, but, but it's cut off on my the way I'm looking at it here. Okay, okay. Um, I, I guess all that I'm saying is that if the idea, I mean, I guess what I would almost say is that if the first sentence says shall, then I think <laughs> shall, I, it's almost like I would have it say the, the superintendent shall make any necessary adjustments, blah, 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 comma, unless the superintendent, after consulting with the finance officer, determines that there is a likelihood of blah, blah, blah. Does that make more sense? Because I think as it otherwise reads, each year the superintendent may, I mean, it's just, it's a may. So there's nothing that limits that may, the this, this second sentence is separate. So I would, if what I'm understanding you, Tanya, is that you're trying to accomplish, I would probably change it to each, each year the superintendent shall make the adjustments, blah, 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 living rate, living wage rate, comma, unless the superintendent after consulting with the finance officer, determines that there's a likelihood of an insufficiency in funding. So, I, I think that gets you to the same. I get. I think that gets you to the result that you just described a little cleaner. I think it's ultimately uh, whatever is clear to the board. I think is the point for me. I think I would not want it to be. I don't want. I feel like with that change, it makes it feel, feel like that's not what we're, our assumption is. I think the way it is here to me, maybe I'm, uh, is that the assumption is that this is going to happen unless there's the finance officer comes in and says, Dr. Mabenga or Dr. Superintendent, there's this financial situation. So I think this, the reason it's May is you don't want to tie them. If the ex expectation is the superintendent does it. That's why it's May. Versus if you put in shell, then this is what, has to happen and then you go around to the finance officer. So right. so right. So I think that you would say, I mean, in my mind, I guess, I, can I mean, just, I, you know, there are always two or three ways it's gonna cat. But I mean, I, I think that right. I think it would more clearly get to the point of it will happen unless if it says each year it shall happen unless the superintendent after consulting with the finance officer, determines that there's a likelihood of insufficiency in funding. Can I make a, you had a comment? Yeah, can I make it just a suggestion that may get at that? Uh, at least it would work for me if we left the shall in the first paragraph, and but left the second paragraph to simply say something to the effect of that the superintendent shall have the power if after consulting with the finance officer, so I should have the, the power to uh, not implement this uh, adjustment if, and then put everything else in the second paragraph. Yeah, I that, mean, the other that way- That would leave that. the first paragraph oh. as, as still making the strong statement that, that um, Natalie and many want to make, but would clarify in, in the way that I would want so that a superintendent is not locked in if, if we're looking at because it says in the second paragraph, the only time this happens is if we're having to actually reduce our budget and the superintendent is having to make changes in the context of a budget that's going backwards, uh, which we would hope is a very rare situation. So uh, that's a change that I could live with. 
No, but I was just say we could also come back to the to the board and waive that part of the policy. I mean, the living wage policy could be waived by a, a future board if need be in an exigent circumstance. So I just don't, I still don't understand the strong need to, to soften it with that second addition. But um, I do appreciate the addition of shall that satisfies part of my concern for sure. Okay, well, we already have a motion on the floor and it's been properly seconded. This was our discussion period. So, um, if we're remind looking at, me what that is when you get to it. The most, all right. Yeah. So the motion on the floor is to approve uh, policy seventy six hundred as presented here with May and then the second paragraph. <clears throat> That's the motion on the floor. It's been properly seconded. If we are looking to make further adjustments here, we're going to need to vote this down, and then. Uh, uh, instruct the administration on what the changes should be, then we'd have to vote on that. I just want to make sure you guys understand that. So we have to do a roll call vote here because the motion has been seconded. Then whatever happens, if we vote it down, then we're going to need to instruct Ms. Giovanni on what we have to do. We'll have a, a little bit further discussion there, Steve. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think my preference, I think I'm, I'm going to vote no and then suggest we kick it back to the administration to uh, take another shot at, at wording it. I don't think we're in a rush and that's been done tonight. So uh, that that's my plan at least. Okay. All right. So I'll do a roll call vote um, and we'll see what happens. So uh, Mr. Kaysen. Nay. Ms. Byer. No. Ms. Fort Brown. No. Mr. Honoré. No. Mr. Sears. Yes. Ms. Umstead. No. Chair votes no as well. It it fails six to one. Um, so the policy fails six to one. Are we saying send it back to administration to, to rework a little bit further? That's what I'm saying, yes. And okay. I would agree right. with that. Um, with the, I believe in a living wage. I don't want us to leave this um, this meeting with that thought, but I think it's important for the administration to take some time to review this um, policy. Yeah. Okay. And so we'll leave that to you, Ms. Giovanni, and we'll revisit it. And then we will go back, we'll move to the next policy. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. Very good. Ms. Smith, if you could... Bring the PowerPoint back up, please. So our the final policy uh, to be discussed um, tonight that is on the PowerPoint is 7610, Defense of Board Members and Employees. Uh, the board adopted this policy uh, not long ago, but NCSBA did amend the language and the full policy is in the packet. Uh, but the additional language that they're adding is they want Every, every time there's a lawsuit filed for board members and employees to submit that to, their suggestion is to submit that to your homeowners or whatever other liability coverages that you have and get a denial of coverage before the board provides a defense. Um, I contacted them to find out what uh, the source of this was and it was the school board that um, prompted this was insured through um, the NICSPIT trust and not through um, an insurance um, provider, which is what we are. And the way that um, NICSPIT's language is written is regarding like a lot of its excess coverage and our policies aren't that way. So we feel that it was my recommendation that we not include this language because every time anyone gets uh, sued, they would then have to take that paperwork to their own individual carrier. And it is the policy of the board mm -hmm. Uh, to provide defense for um, activities that occur within the course and scope of employment. I'm happy to entertain. All right. Um, any discussion here? The last time, maybe we're. <laughs> They were discussion out. Yeah. All right. So, um, 
If there's no discussion, I'll accept the motion. Do we actually need a motion? If we're not making any change, do we need to do anything? I think we can do, um, if you want to do like a full motion, basically for the entire packet where you say that you're accepting the changes from the policies as adopted, suggested and recommended by administration absent the 6600 living wage and the changes to the now we we voted on the first one we actually voted twice on the second one right yes. so this is a separate one if we do this one individually um I so think we're, we're not we're not go ahead so you've already done it for the shared leave so i've got that motion i've got the direction for the 7600 so what i would like is a motion for the arrest of the policies to be moved to the consent agenda at the next meeting. Okay. And okay. I think, we, I don't know if we need to clarify it. I feel like I'm in a good place, but just for the record, to clarify again that 7600 administration is instructed to bring that back for a second reading at the next board meeting. That, that would be second reading at that point. Yes. Okay, so the request is for us to um, send this packet of uh, policies to the net to the next board meeting for second reading, instructing um, the administration to come back with 7600, that different word than 7600, and um, everything else just move as is to consent. I moved. All right, I'll take Ms. Brown's as a second. I'll take Natalie's as a mo movement. So it's been moved and properly seconded um, that we move these policies, the second reading on the consent agenda for next meeting. However, 7600 will need to be reworded by the administration based on our discussion today. Um, I'll do a roll call vote. Ms. Umstead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I approve. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. Sears. Yes. Um, Mr. Unruh. Yes. Ms. Byer. Yes. Mr. Kaysen. Yes. And the illustrious Ms. Fort Brown. Yes. All right. Um, the chair votes yes as well. Passes unanimously. It goes to consent, absent of the 7600 changes. Um, actually, I believe that was the last item on our agenda uh, for open session. I will now accept the motion to go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. So move. Second. Has been moved and properly second that we go into closed session for the reasons stated on the agenda. All in favor, please reply your, with your vote, Ms. Umstead. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Fort Brown. Aye. Ms. Byer. Aye. Mr. Unruh, did I get you Aye. already? And Ms. Umstead. To, uh, everything was moving around when people leave, and so I couldn't. I'm, I lost my. Chair. Oh, Mr. Kaysen. Aye. All right. The, the chair votes uh, aye as well. We're now in closed session. Please meet us in the uh, other session. Thank you. Bye, everyone.
we are back. We will let Miss McNulty get us back online, I guess, if we're not already. You are. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're back in open session. Dr. Wabenga. Thank you, Chairman Lee, members of the board. I'm here to seek approval for the personal reporters to discuss at the closed session. Move approval. Second. Has been moved by Ms. Byer, properly seconded by Mr. Unruh, uh, that we approve the personnel report for 520-2020. I'll do a roll call vote. Um, please vote as you feel. Ms. Umstead. Uh, aye. Mr. Unruh. Aye. Mr. Kaysen. Aye. Mr. Sears. Aye. Ms. Byer. Aye. Uh, Ms. Fort Brown didn't make she it. She said that her mail is, she said, don't wait on her. Go ahead and good night. She said her mail is slow. <laughs> don't wait on her. Okay. Okay, that's fine. The chair votes aye as well. And this passes unanimously. Six, uh, six zero. Okay. So that would be the end of our meeting. Again, I just want to give a shout out to our IT group. I get on a lot of calls like this, especially with government officials. And this meeting runs smooth, the smoothest of all of our elected officials. If you watch them on TV, if you watch them, you know, on YouTube or anywhere, there's no meeting that runs as smooth as this. So I always have to give a shout out to our AV, to our, you know, to our IT group who gets us together, gets us looking correctly, because you guys are absolutely number one in all of the government government entities here. No one does it like we do. So I really appreciate you guys' work. And with that, everyone, I will say, have a good night. We are adjourned. Bye, everyone. <laughs>